Welcome to tonight's public lecture. I am Dr. Constance Locke. I'm a senior lecturer in practice in the Department of Management here at the LSE. I'm also the deputy head of the LSE's Behavioral Research Lab, which is why I'm particularly excited about Caroline Webb's new book, How to Have a Good Day, because this book basically shows how behavioral research can improve our daily working lives. And behavioral research is exactly what we do in the LSE lab. Um, the lab opened in 2011, and since then we've conducted over 100 studies with over 18,000 participants, which is about 3,600 participants a year. Um, the lab is open to all LSE departments, so if you're a staff member at the LSE, you can use the lab. Just go to our website and find out about it. And if you're a student, then you can be a participant and get paid 10 pounds an hour to participate in a research study. Anyway, enough about the lab. I just had to do that. Um, let me get back to Caroline Webb's book. So I have read the book. I was given a pre-production copy, and I highly recommend it. It's, it uses solid academic research that's published in top journals, including lab research, although not from the LSE lab just yet. I think our lab is a bit too young. Maybe in the next edition. The sequel. <laughs> yeah, the sequel. Um, the problem with academic research is that it's published in academic journals. Okay, these journals are expensive to subscribe to, they're difficult to read, and the thing is, academic research is not really intended to be practical. <laughs> I mean, to be really honest, the purpose of academic research is to contribute to our knowledge on a particular subject. The primary purpose is not to give practical advice. Um, it's great if you can, but, so this is the problem, is that we end up with all of this research that's difficult to read, read difficult to access, and not necessarily practical. Um, and you have practitioners who want to understand how to do their jobs better, improve their lives, et cetera. So what I love about this book is this, it essentially bridges that gap, that gap between um, academic research and giving practical advice. Let me tell you a bit more about Caroline Webb. So Caroline is the CEO of Seven Shift, which is a firm that takes insights from behavioral research to help people improve their working lives. But she started her career as an economist, working in public policy at the Bank of England. And her formal education is in economics. She read um, economics at Cambridge for her undergraduate degree. Um, and then she did an MPhil in economics in Oxford. And then she moved on to McKinsey the management consulting firm, where she spent about 12 years. She helped organizations shift their culture in a more positive direction. She co-founded McKinsey's leadership practice, working with leaders to improve their personal effectiveness. And she also co-founded their flagship leader, leadership development course for female, senior female executives. Now she continues to be a senior advisor to McKinsey, but she's also founded her own company, Seven Shift. At Seven Shift, she takes evidence from neuroscience, economics, psychology, and she blends these insights with her management consulting and coaching work to help her clients discover how to be their best and how to bring the best out of their colleagues. So the Twitter hashtag, for those of you who use Twitter, um, for tonight is, as you can see on the screen, LSE Good Day. Um, also, if you follow this hashtag, you will um, gain exclusive insights into some of the research that we conduct here at the LSE Behavioral Lab. Um, I think a lot of it is going to be around my research, so you're going to get sick of hearing from me. Um, after the lecture, there will be a, you will be able to ask questions, and there will also be a book signing. So the book is going to be on sale outside the theater. Can I please ask you to put your phones on silent? This evening's event is being recorded, and hopefully, I've been, I've been told to say hopefully, it will be made available as a podcast and video, subject to no um, technical difficulties. <laughs> Which we're about to discover yes, right now. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so anyway, please join me in welcoming Caroline Webb.
I've just had the idea for the sequel. It's how to have a good night. It's obviously <laughs> give a lecture at LSE. <laughs> Wonderful to be here. Thank you very much for, for coming in such numbers. And um, I have to start by admitting that I don't always have a good day. <laughs> I have had bad days. And um, I'll tell you one classic one that really sticks in my mind. It was when I was a young consultant at McKinsey and I was working on a project which saw me doing battle with a photocopier in the bottom of a grey concrete office block in Blackfriars. And I think it's fair to say that the, the, <laughs> the photocopier was definitely winning. So I had a document that I was uh, obviously photocopying and it was a very confidential <laughs> document because I was doing a project with the, with the client, which was actually all good news. We were looking for growth opportunities. There was lots that was going to be possible for this business. But there was likely to be some organizational change. And the ideas on that were in this document. And it was going to be presented to the CEO later that day. So I was photocopying the document, very conscious that the CEO needed to be the first person to see this document. But I think you can probably imagine what then happens next. Paper jam. <laughs> and I'm photocopying this document, and the thing judders to a halt. So now, I mean, I'm thinking, well, I don't mind. I know how to fix a paper jam. You know, I just open the flap. Nothing. I open another flap. Nothing. At this point, I'm starting to sweat a little because I'm realizing I can't step away from the machine. Confidential document. But I also don't clearly know what I'm doing. <laughs> And then people start coming by, and they start to, <laughs> you know, you know how it is. You know, they sh shoot you sort of sympathetic glances. You're like, yes, I am sitting on the floor trying to fix a photocopy. And eventually one nice person said, okay, we have no tech support in the building, but I'm going to go and get you a photocopy manual. <laughs> 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 and, I mean, I was amazed that such a thing was actually in the building. It was, thank goodness. You know, so I sat there, I was leafing through the door, and eventually I found a hidden flap. And I opened it, and this was what I found. And I spent half an hour pulling it out. <laughs> like, I'm still not sure that I ever got the whole thing out. <laughs> so there were bad days. That was not a great day. But um, when you think about the things that get in the way, there are plenty of them. There are constraints like technological malfunctions, wardrobe malfunctions, grumpy colleagues, difficult deadlines, heavy workloads. Any of that ring any bells with any of you? Right, okay. So of course there are constraints. But I've always been interested in something which I call realistic optimism. You know, what, what can you do if you were to acknowledge the constraints that you face, but then look for the wiggle room within them? And that's in contrast to a certain approach, which is to say, just think that everything's amazing and it will be. I mean, there's a certain self-help genre out there which, you know, does take that approach. But science, yay, science. Behavioral science is where many of the answers lie. Because if you start to understand a little of how the brain works and you start to understand a little of why we think and feel and behave and choose as we do, then... There's so much more ch chance for, oh yeah, sorry, I did want to just show you um, something which I discovered, just for the who, are the, who are the economists in the room? Okay, there you are, this, this chart's for you, there we are. Inverse relationship between joy and paper jams, which I, I distinctively proved during that, uh, that experience. So we can, we can make things better. We can exploit the wiggle room around the constraints of our everyday lives, and we do not have to use voodoo dolls for it thanks to the work that many of you are doing in your labs and in your research. So let me now talk about three things. Three things that we now be able, we're able to do if we understand some of the shortcuts that our brains take. And what I'm going to talk about tonight is how understanding the shortcuts that your brains take can improve reality can overcome procrastination and even give yourself a boost when you need it. Now that seems like quite a good recipe for improving the quality of your day, I think. I hope you'd, ad you'd agree. Okay. But I probably need to say just a little something about what I mean by shortcuts. 
or as some of you might call them, heuristics, the shortcuts that our brains take in order to help us navigate the world. So our brains are infernally complex, marvelously complex. All the things that we're able to do result from the interaction of many systems in the brain. They allow us to do sums and read the emotions of people around us and even tell jokes if they're connected to a loud enough mouth. I'm going to talk about a couple of systems, which I call the deliberate system and the automatic system. The, the deliberate system, you might know as the C system or the control system, or you might know it as system two, you might know it as the slow system if you're fans of Daniel Kahneman. And the deliberate system is fantastically powerful. It powers our conscious reasoning. It's responsible for our self-control. Um, it helps us be nicer people because it helps us manage our emotions. And it's responsible for forward thinking and planning. It's like, however, a bit, a bit like a demanding, brilliant professor with too much to do all the time. It's got big capacity constraints. There's only a certain amount it can do. So thank goodness for the professor's efficient assistant whose job is to make everything as easy as possible. And this is the automatic system. The automatic system, the idea is that it makes things as simple as possible. It chooses whatever's easy and appealing. Whatever options are, uh, make it easier for the professor to get through his difficult days. Now, many of you will know that one of the challenges with the shortcuts that the automatic system takes is that it can end up leading us to make simple decisions that aren't necessarily correct. Because you have this kind of interaction between the professor and the assistant. The professor says, it's all very complicated, there's lots to think about, lots of factors to weigh up, and I'm really not sure what the right decision to make is. Meanwhile, the assistant, the automatic system, is saying, you know what, chill out. I know some shortcuts. We're going to make this really simple, really easy. And as a result, of course, we end up with blind spots. And of course, we sometimes think about the easy thing rather than the right thing. Of course. But I mentioned that shortcuts can give us some great clues about how to improve reality, overcome procrastination, and even give ourselves a boost. So let's get on with that. Because it's a bit like finding the photocopier manual. Once we understand these shortcuts that the automatic system is taking, it's not just that they maybe make us a bit quirky in the decisions we make, but they make us, they give us the clues as to how we might make things better. So let me talk first of all about reality and how you might, uh, might hack your reality. I'll tell you about another day that my reality wasn't all that much fun. I was, by this time, a bit more senior at McKinsey. I was a partner. And I was working on a project that I didn't want to be on. Just been put on it. It was a large-scale corporate change program. And I was much more, by that time, into smaller-scale work, working with individuals, working with senior teams, boards, groups, that sort of thing. I was not happy about it. But I was trying to do, trying to do the right thing, said yes to the project. I was working with this guy called Lucas. We'll call him Lucas, let's say. <laughs> I've called him Lucas in the book. So, <laughs> he's Lucas. Um, so picture wiry, tall, energetic German guy. He is the anchor, the engine for this project, and he's loving it. We're meeting for the first time with the clients. And this meeting is, it, I discover, in a horrible room. It's in a long, thin video conference room that's dark, low ceiling, the opposite of this. It's one of these rooms you walk in and your heart just sinks. <coughs> and I'm already annoyed for, that I'm on the project. I'm annoyed that the meeting has been set up in a way that I think is not going to be effective because the clients aren't even in the room. They're on the screen. They're on the screen. So how can you possibly bond with these new clients of yours when they're on the screen? So I walk in and I'm in a grumpy mood and I want more coffee and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, ugh. Meanwhile, Lucas has a deck of paper this big. Clearly, effective photocopying <laughs> has gone on. <laughs> 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 
And he then barrels through it, bam, 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 bam. To my mind, it's exactly the kind of meeting that I feared. Lots of misunderstandings, lots of people talking over each other, lots of frowns. And we get through it, but I'm not happy. A little while later, I think, I've got to talk to Lucas about this. You know, this is not a great way to start. And we sat down. It was in my office. I can still picture it. And I, I said to him, you know, this was a terrible way to start the project. I'm really worried about the relationship that we now have with the clients. And he looked at me like I was an idiot. Just totally incredulous. He had no recollection of anything that I was saying. In fact, the things that he'd seen and that he actually managed to convince me did happen were lots of progress, people happy with the progress. There was even some things that people laughed at. I didn't really have any recollection of that, but as he said it, I was like, oh, yeah, I think that might have actually happened. How did we have such a different experience? How did we have such a different experience? And specifically of interest to me, why did he enjoy himself so much more? <laughs> and the answer goes back to the shortcuts that our brains are taking. So you've got the overworked deliberate system. The professor can only do a certain amount of stuff at any one time. Can only take in a certain amount of information. And so the, the assistant, the automatic system, is very quietly filtering out loads of stuff. So that the professor thinks he's experiencing reality, but he's not. He's actually not seeing or hearing most of what's going on around him. That's how you can walk down a street that's really familiar to you and you suddenly see a building you don't think you've even noticed before. The automatic system previously filtered that out. That's how you can come out of a movie or a meeting, indeed, and have a completely different recollection of what was going on compared to the other person. So or indeed a spouse, I should say. Those conversations where you just don't remember hearing the same thing? Yeah. So what is going on? What is it that the automatic system decides is important enough? Yeah, I can see some spouses looking at each other in the way. What is, it, what is it that the automatic system decides is important enough for us to actually notice consciously? And the answer is it's down to whatever's top of mind. This is amazing. It's down to whatever's top of mind. The automatic system looks around you and says, OK, uh, if you're in a good mood, then I'll see everything that confirms that you should be in a good mood. And if you're in a bad mood, I'll see everything that confirms you should be in a bad mood. There's a nice study that I particularly like, which involved radiologists. It was a study at Harvard. <coughs> radiologists whose job is to look through lung scans uh, to spot abnormalities. And these guys were given a stack of actually genuine lung scans. And in the last of the lung scans, there was a gorilla printed inside the lung scan. And the question is, how many of the radiologists saw the gorilla? Some of you might even know the study. 83% of the radiologists did not see the gorilla, even though their job is to spot abnormalities in lung scans. Even though eye tracking devices suggested that they were actually looking directly at it. Even though the gorilla was 44 times the size of the average lung nodule. How is this possible? Because they hadn't decided that gorillas were their aim. So their automatic system said, well, that's not top of mind and that's irrelevant. So you're not going to notice it. Now, obviously, that means that our starting point when we go into a day or a meeting or a task or a lecture is incredibly important because whatever is top of mind for us will then shape what we notice. Attitudes are the same. Another study had a bunch of people, let's say this half of the room, put into a terrible mood by being given a test where they were just given random results that suggested that they failed the test. That would put you in a bad mood, right? You think you've done OK, and then you're told that you failed. It doesn't matter that it's just a research piece in a lab, right? You're still <coughs> a bit upset. And then they see a, a hill, and they rate the hill as steeper and less pleasant to climb than people on this side of the room who haven't been put in a bad mood. So our attitudes even shape what we perceive. So here's the great news. It means that 
If you check in with what your aims are and you check in with where your attitude is, it's going to really shape where your attention goes. And this has been transformational for me. I mean, I use a process which I call setting intentions, which is just a shorthand for me, which means before going into a conversation like the one with Lucas and the clients on the screen, I ask myself, what really matters to me? What's my real aim? Then I say, okay, where am I at? Have I got any negative assumptions about what's going to happen? Because I know that's going to shape what I then perceive. And then I ask myself, okay, well, where do, where do I really want to put my attention? And I have to say that this has meant that I haven't really had any terrible meetings like that since I started setting my intentions. Because even if I'm in the middle of a terrible meeting and it's going south, I can say, okay, hang on, what really matters now? <laughs> what's my aim now? And then I can say, okay, well, what I want to do is learn from <laughs> this awful situation that's happening. And perhaps it's also, I want to hear what other people have to say to understand why this is going wrong. And then the rest of the meeting plays out very differently. I also use it just to reset my mood when I'm as grumpy as I was that day with Lucas. You know, and you're walking to work and you're annoyed with the tube and the commuters and other days when perhaps something goes wrong, your document gets lost in a photocopier, you think, okay, I notice that I'm in a bad mood. Why don't I decide to notice a few good things in the next 10 minutes? You know, maybe it's a stupid hat that someone's wearing, something that makes you smile. Noticing someone helping another person up the stairs with their bag. Any of these things, you'll feel good when you see these things, right? And then as soon as you start to feel good, that's what's top of mind. And then you see more good things. That's quite a good recipe for shaping the reality that you're experiencing. So I'd like you now to take 30 seconds to talk to the person next to you about what strikes you as most interesting about this research and how you can apply it to yourselves. And 30 seconds isn't going to feel like enough, but I'm going to give that to you and then I'm going to rudely interrupt you and then bring you back for the next session. 30 seconds. Interruption. Fantastic. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. So next, I'd like to talk about procrastination. Who here procrastinates? <laughs> yeah, okay. Just checking, because I could do something else, right? Um, so procrastination, why does that factor into whether you have a good day or not? We all feel great when we've got the stuff done that really matters. You get to the end of the day and you feel that you deserve a wonderful evening because you've managed to tick off the thing that really needed to be done. And then, co by contrast, there's the days when you just think, where did the day go? It's just urgent stuff and nothing important actually happened. Or, you know, maybe there was something that was just really awkward that you're really avoiding. So... The story I want to tell about procrastination is not actually mine, although it absolutely could be. It's a story from George Akerlof, a Nobel Prize winning economist. And he tells a story of when he was living in India. Um, and he was um, enjoying a visit from his friend Joe Stiglitz, another very well-known economist. And Stiglitz had obviously done some shopping while he was in India because um, when he came to pack up his stuff to go home, he couldn't get it all into his, his luggage. So Akerlof said, no worries, I'll package it up and send it back to the US for you. No problem at all. Except that once Joe Stiglitz had gone, what do you think happened? Days passed. Day after day after day, he said, oh, I must get that done. Yeah, I will do it. I will do it. I must do it. Oh, my God, it now, how many weeks? 
eight months later, <laughs> he still hadn't sent the clothes. And in fact, the only reason that the clothes ever got back to Stiglitz was because Akerlof happened to know someone who was going to the US and he just said, look, can you take these clothes? Luckily for us, he got very interested in procrastination after that. Did some very interesting research. But why? Why does such a thing happen? Apart from the fact that his eight months makes me feel a little bit better about the email that I'm putting off replying to that's in my inbox, why is it that we all put our hands up when we think about procrastination? And the answer is that there's a particular type of task where we procrastinate. We're just sort of designed for it, really, which is tasks where we have present effort, so immediate effort that we have to put in now for some kind of future benefit, right? So think about the classic topics like saving for your future or eating healthily for your future health. And in this case, of course, we're thinking about uh, an email. Oh, gosh, what's happening? Really exciting, though. Ooh. <laughs> Um, we're thinking about, you know, my email that I haven't, I haven't knuckled down and written. Or in terms of Akolov's not sending back the clothes, he's got to put in effort now to send these clothes back. He, has, he thought it was going to take him a few hours. He was in India, not in King's Cross. And the future benefit was to the relationship, the quality of the relationship with Stiglitz. Um, maybe Stiglitz would be more likely to do him a favour in the future. Much harder for the brain to process these abstract future benefits than the concrete reality of the here and now, the effort that's needed now. And that's the heart of the issue, something that you may know of as present bias, right? So our brain will always tend to like to think about the present rather than the future. And if the present involves effort, then you're likely to procrastinate. So what can we do about this? I mean, it's such a universal human thing. And there's so much self-help advice out there on procrastination, right? But if you know that the root of procrastination is present bias, then that gives you a clue for a framework for thinking about how you overcome it. You need to think about how do you make the present effort feel smaller, and the future benefit feel bigger? How do you make the current effort feel smaller and the future benefit feel bigger, more real, more tangible? And there are a bunch of things that I think work well that I apply myself to my unwritten emails. When I'm trying to think about making the benefits of action feel bigger, I mean, the very basic thing that I first do is I think about how great is it going to feel at the end of the day when I've got this done? Which sort of seems obvious, but how many times do you actually think forward to how it's going to feel when you've got the thing done? Or indeed, how the other person is going to feel when you've got the thing done? We don't tend to do that. And it makes it more vivid and more real in your brain. So that's a good first start, and it's good for the really small things. Then the challenge is that there's still perhaps a while that you need to wait for that good feeling. So what can you do to add short-term payoffs sooner so that you're tilting that balance still further between the benefits and the costs? And for me, and this is a bit of an admission, I don't think I've ever said this out loud before, I like online grocery shopping. <laughs> for me, I like, I like online grocery shopping, and for me, that is a very relaxing task. It kind of, I know, I know. But it needs, it needs to be done, it's easy, and, you know, it makes me feel good about myself that I've, you know, put food in the fridge. I don't know. I'm not, I just, I just need to find a task that feels rewarding that I can do after I've written the email. And that's bringing a short-term payoff further up. Maybe the short-term payoff, the short-term reward is to go for a walk, or maybe to call a friend. Or maybe it's to write an email that I've actually been looking forward to writing. So being smart about giving yourself a quick reward and promising yourself that quick reward 
helps to shift the balance. Then there's pre-commitment, which has been shown to really lessen the amount of self-control that the brain's deliberate system has to exert when we're trying to do the right thing. So pre-commitment <coughs> means uh, telling my husband that I'm going to do something later on in the day, which means that at the end of the day I feel great rather than sheepish when he asks, yeah, did you do that, honey? And pre-commitment is even stronger if you make it very social. And that might mean in the work context that you tell a bunch of people that you're going to get back to them by the end of the day. Or in Akalov's context, maybe he would have actually promised Stiglitz that there was a date by which he'd send it back, and maybe he would have found a peg to hang that on and discovered when there was a time that Stiglitz needed a particular pair of trousers. Right. So you make the benefits of action feel bigger. The other thing you can do is make the costs of action feel smaller. And this I use all the time. So reducing the size of that initial first step until it's so tiny, absolutely no excuse for not getting it done. If you think about, well, taking my difficult email, why don't I get it done? Why don't I just write the difficult email which says, no, I'm not going to speak at this event because I'm doing LSE. What, what, how do I embrace that difficult challenge? It's because I don't, I, don't know, I don't know what to say that I'm not replying. I don't know how to put it. But to make it smaller, I can write a draft. What's the smallest first step I can take? I can write a draft. The smallest first tape I, step I can take is that I can type out a few bullet points and just save that to draft. It's the small first step, which then gives your brain a sense of reward, which gives you the motivation to take the next step and the next step. So break it down and then tie it to something you like. That's another way of reducing the costs of getting something done. So in my case, um, I have a, sometimes I treat myself to a taxi, and my little rule is that when I'm in a taxi on my own, I write an email I've been putting off. <coughs> so if I ever have to write you an email that's a bit awkward, know that it was written in a taxi. <laughs> so the benefits there, it just again, lessens the sense of cost. So I'd like you now to, to think about the thing that you've been putting off for eight months, or maybe just a week, and it's on your to-do list, and you know it's there, because it's lurking. And I'd like you to turn to the person next to you and think about which of these techniques might you try a little bit more of tomorrow. Sometimes I only need one to get off my ass, and sometimes I need all five. So feel free to talk about more than one if you want but I'd like you to just take a moment to think about which one are you going to try tomorrow? Off you go, 30 seconds. Excellent. Good job. So you've thought about how to shift reality. You've thought about how to get done the things that you really want to get done. Now let's talk about how to get yourself a bit of a boost. And I'm going to talk about the least scientific nudging experiment ever run in the whole world. And I'm really sorry, Compton. This is, um, you know, really shouldn't go outside this room. So I've been asked... Uh, to give a presentation at an internal McKinsey conference in Rome, as it happens. Nice place to give a conference talk. And they had asked me to do something sexy. Not like that. <laughs> but they wanted something, they knew that I worked on behavioral stuff, and they knew that it was kind of, you know, interesting what might be going on in that field. And so they said, well, could you come and do something on that? So I said, yes, fine, sure, of course. Um, 
And I thought, wouldn't it be really fun, and also funny, if we could find a way to nudge half of the room into a place that was happier and more productive in 15 minutes? I thought it was quite fun. And there was a group of, uh, group of, group of uh, people at McKinsey who thought it was also quite fun. We had this sort of skunk works team, just a few of us, planning how to do this. <laughs> and um, we came up with a plan. And on the day, there were about 70 people filing into a room that looked like this, one of these sort of classic hotel conference rooms, uh, round tables, chairs around them. Bigger than that, though, because there were sort of two columns of these round tables stretching all the way into the distance. And <laughs> people were coming in in the morning, sitting down randomly, just as you did. You sat down randomly at uh, the seat that you're sitting in, right? So they came in randomly and they sat down. And then when we got to the point where the talk was going to start, um, we barred the doors, which is quite unusual at a conference. <laughs> And the people outside were not very happy, but we had to do that. Otherwise, you know, the very small amount of control we were introducing into the experimental environment was going to disappear. So we had this, had this, sa this space, sealed room. And I got on the stage and I said, blah, 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 welcome. Going to do something about behaviour. Going to give you a task to do that will give us some data for that. And this is a bunch of McKinsey consultants, so they're like, task, yes, bring it on, yes. <laughs> and then, you know, there's a sense that it's a competitive task that's even better. <laughs> Wonderful. The idea is that they have to come up with as many ideas as possible for improving the quality of internal conferences, the sort of thing that they're currently attending. So we thought that was a bit meta, it's quite good. Um, so they, <laughs> so they, they, um, they knuckle down to the task, except that, what we were doing was asking them to follow different instruction sheets. And the left-hand side of the room was primed and anchored and framed very differently to the right-hand side. So what I mean by that is, some of you may recognize these cards. They're from the nudge unit, which uh, used to be part of the government's efforts to introduce behavioral science into public policy. They created this deck of cards which has about 40 nudges on them, all the things that you might do to nudge someone's behavior in a certain direction. <coughs> and they have a game which involves picking three cards and applying them to any uh, policy issue. So we basically did that. We picked out three cards. This is where the whole scientific aspect of this breaks down completely because we just decided, let's just throw everything at this. First of all, we thought about anchoring. This is the shortcut where your brain says, huh, there's a number, that's quite helpful, I'll just take that and apply that to whatever I'm about to decide to do. So the classic study here is by Dan Ariely, who discovered that when people recited their social security number which, and ended in a higher number, they then went on to bid more highly in an auction just after that. No connection between the two, but the number being higher meant that they then went on to bid more highly in an auction. So we thought, okay, we can do, we can do something here. We can, we can make this half of the room think that three uh, ideas is appropriate by putting three bullet points on the card. And we can make this half of the room think that uh, 10 is appropriate by having one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and then more question mark at the end. So we anchored. We thought about framing effects, framing effects. That means that your brain is always looking for things that are uh, easy and appealing to think about and will be drawn to that. So if you frame something positively, people are more likely to be drawn to it. You're going to want to think about it and engage with it versus framing something negatively. So we thought, okay, how do we do this? One side of the room, this side. Sorry, guys, you're really getting the raw deal here. So you get a card that says, Think about the worst conference you've ever attended. And then think about how you could use that to make things a bit better. And then you guys get a card that says, think about the best conference you've ever attended. And think about how you could use that to make conferences way better. So framing. We framed the task differently. Same task. And then we, we threw in a bunch of priming effects. So priming is where your brain thinks the shortcut is, Oh, um, 
that's suggestive of this, and therefore that's the right thing to think or do or feel. You've used this, by the way, if you've ever had a dinner party and you've put on nice music to create a nice mood, right? The cue, the clue in the environment is the music, which then tells your brain, oh, well, then I should feel relaxed and happy. So we thought, well, what can we do here? We did a bunch of things. The main thing was that we put a picture of smiling people on the... <laughs> yeah, I know. But, you know, we were trying everything. Smiling people on both sides of the, of the, the instruction sheet. This is vaguely what it looks like. I don't know whether you can see. So this is really simple and, and plain, three bullet points, and then the guys on the right had this. Um, so we had, we had them do this task for 15 minutes and then um, managed to get the results back. I was just blurbing on, just saying, talking about the sort of stuff I'm saying now. And then the results came in. <sighs> And I really, I, I thought the results might be a bit wafer thin and then I'd have to kind of talk around it. <laughs> but it wasn't, it was great. It was fantastic. So um, I'm sorry, you guys, but these guys had a conversation that they rated when I asked them to rate it as 22% better than you guys. And when we asked them to, as well as rating the quality of the conversation, we asked them to enter the number of ideas they'd come up with in a keypad, you guys came up with 45% more ideas. Woo! <laughs> and the room went crazy because, you know, these are people who are very competitive and think, you know, they're quite sharp. And the idea that they could be nudged, that their mood and their performance could be nudged by something as peripheral as words or numbers or pictures that were just in the environment was just very strange for them. So what's the upshot? Why don't we do this more for ourselves? We talk about nudging in terms of public policy and creating an impact on other people. But what about ourselves? Why don't we think about how to frame topics so that we're more willing to engage with them? Why don't we think about what the ideal situation is and how we get more of that in the same way as you guys did when thinking about the conferences and how to improve it? Why don't we think about the priming cues that we might put in our environment to put us in a particular mood? I mean, this research is very, very controversial because it's very hard to replicate a study that says you play this song and you create this effect. You hold this hot drink and you create this sort of warmth. Some of you may know some of the controversy that's in this area. But we do know that the brain is highly associative. So if I associate... Donna Summer's I Feel Love with an amazing night that I had watching the Blue Man Group perform that makes me feel really energised every time I hear it, then why not listen to it or sing it to myself or hum it to myself before I come on stage? Just say. <laughs> <laughs> if I do have an association between a clear head and a clear desk, why don't I just clear my desk from time to time when I need to think more clearly? If I think that a relaxed environment helps to have a relaxed conversation, why don't I be a little bit more deliberate about that when I'm planning a difficult conversation? And these are things I do. These are things I do every day. So I suppose the opportunity then is to nudge thyself. Many of you will be studying to think about how do you nudge other people. The opportunity here is how to think about how you nudge yourself. How do you frame your tasks in a way that's going to make it more likely you'll engage with them with the, your full intelligence? And how do you create the best possible working environment for the kind of conversations and thinking and feeling that you want to have? So there we are. Set clear intentions to shape your reality. Tweak the cost-benefit trade-off to overcome procrastination. And then create a bunch of positive nudges around yourself to lift your mood and your performance. And that's not a bad recipe for a better day. There we are. Thank you, Caroline. Um, we're going to open it up for questions now. Could you please... Um, Raise your hand so I can see it, and then wait for the stewards to bring a microphone around to you. Um, and tell us your name and your affiliation before you ask your question. Up on the balcony there. 
Hi, thank you so much for an engaging talk. My name is Laura Kutrina. I'm a third year PhD student in the Department of Social Policy. I also worked on the book Happiness by Design by oh. Paul Dolan. Great. You're one of the only people that I've seen to talk about how you can use behavioral science to affect <laughs> yourself and essentially to nudge yourself. But I haven't heard you talk as much about what the ultimate outcome would be. You've talked about things like a good day, benefit, happiness, rewarding tasks, creativity, productivity, and thinking is, and feelings, or thoughts and feelings. What do you think the ultimate outcome is and why? <laughs> and thanks. You mean there's more than a good day? <laughs> Yeah, there's a, there's a quote I like from uh, the writer Annie Dillard, and she says, the way, we spend our li uh, the way we spend our days is, of course, the way we spend our lives. I'm quite a strong believer in the fact that you know, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of work out there helping you think about how to choose the right career and how to think about uh, the right things to make your life meaningful. There's a little bit less about the day-to-day. And the, the quotidian, the, you know, how do you handle your inbox? How do you think about planning a day? How do you think about handling a difficult conversation? And in all the work that I did, helping companies be as effective as they could be, as high performing as they could be, I so often found that the real changes came down to these tiny, tiny everyday shifts. You know, so a company would be trying to, uh, you know, develop a whole new global strategy, which meant that they had to become more collaborative. But then the rubber really hits the road when maybe there's a turf battle between two divisions. And actually, how do you handle that? What, what actually happens? And how do you handle that in a way that allows you to raise differences but stay in a really good collaborative space? So the more I, the more I worked in this area, the more I realized that there was, there was a gap or there was a need to think about how do you make each moment, each hour, each day add up to something that can make you feel good about where you're going with your life. And of course, because I worked at McKinsey for 12 years, I would also say it adds up to high organizational performance too. I would say that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? No? Yes, right there. Hi, this is Katie Huang. I'm currently a freelance consultant, ex McKinsey. Um, <laughs> well done. I have a, <laughs> uh, I have a question around. Um, did you notice um, whether the nudge effect had much cultural influence, and um, whether certain cultures were better either applying the nudge or avoiding some of the pitfalls of not having a good day? Mm. Um, well, just a, just a quick word about nudging research in general. I think. Um, there is a, as you, as you may know, a huge difficulty in replicating the effects of certain of these studies because it works so much by the associations that are stored in people's brains. So you might have nothing but bad associations with a picture of smiling, happy people. You might, it might just remind you of enforced corporate jollity. And so, you know, you might have ended up thinking that the cards on the right were just, oh, really? So, I mean, there are undoubtedly cultural interests, uh, cu cultural effects in there. And, but I say that the cultural effects kind of come down to the microscopic, that every individual responds and nudges differently. That's why I'm perhaps most interested in people using their own self-awareness to know what's going to help them be at their most effective. You know, what, what, are, the, what are the triggers that are gonna remind them of being sharp or productive? So I feel, I feel that that's relatively safe territory, and it's very hard to nudge a whole company in another direction. Um, but uh, individuals, yeah, that's, that's, we can do that for ourselves. Yes, in the middle there. Uh, do you hear me? Okay, yes. Um, my name is Annette Harms. I'm an economic consultant at London Economics, working on nudges. <laughs> Um, so we know from a lot of academic research that these nudges are very powerful, especially at changing a one-time decision. For example, when you purchase a specific product or whether or not right now you take the chocolate or the healthy option. Mm -hmm. From your experience, from these personal nudges, how lasting are these effects? How often can people actually trick themselves into applying this and then behaving upon it, even though they're aware of what the nudge is doing? Yeah. So I haven't done... Um, 
controlled experiments on this. So I've got to you know, put the caveat on that, a big stamp. But I tell you what I have noticed, it's actually the other way around when, you talk, when you're talking about yourself and the things that you're, um, that you're trying to nudge yourself into doing. Because the more that you associate, like, let's take Donna Summer. The more that I associate listening to I Feel Love with energizing me to go on stage because of the amazing show that I saw that had I Feel Love in the finale, the stronger that connection becomes in my mind. So if I'm hacking my own connections, my own neural connections, then actually the more I nudge myself, the stronger the nudges become. That's definitely not something which is you see in the, in the larger scale research, but that's something that's quite different when I think you're applying it to yourself. Yes, up there. Oh, where'd Stuart go? Oh, there. Right there in the second row, oh, third row. There's a lady at the back in the scarf. Oh, okay. <coughs> yeah. Hold on, let me do up the back first. Hi, uh, Sam Allison. Um, I'm not a behavioral uh, scientist or an economist. I'm just curious, um, do you ever see any harm in understanding your own behaviours too much? <laughs> uh, um, that, that's a funny question, that's good. Um, I, think, I think the thing is that, well, I tell you, there is a problem with writing a book that's called How to Have a Good Day, which is that the moment I frown, <laughs> all my friends and family say, are you having a good day, Caroline? <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't you apply some of your own research? Um, yeah, so I, I think, I mean, mostly it's nothing but good, right? Because frustrations that you might have with other people who are behaving dysfunctionally become, and that is where a lot of our everyday frustrations come from, right? You interact with people who are not behaving as you would like them to. Um, the very fact that, you know, you can think about um, the f your reaction to them being created by fundamental attribution errors, where you, where you assume they're a bad person rather than bad things are happening to them. And that's, you know, that's a recipe for misery. But then if you think, well, no, they're a good person, and bad things are happening to them today, y you can even have some fun with that. You know? Perhaps their cat died. Um, who knows? And then you're in a place where you're embracing potential other explanations for their bad behavior. Oh my God, I mean, that's, that's a transformative move. You start to behave more generously and kindly towards them, which then probably improves their own dysfunctional behavior. So I think there's nothing but good in here, apart from the fact that you get teased by people. That's, that's, the, only, that's the downside. <laughs> Hi, Caroline, my name's Rebecca Sykes. Um, I work with a, in an engineering organization, large group of engineers. Um, so I'm curious about this um, in terms of the uh, attitudes that engineers would take, mm. for example. So you talked earlier about the deliberate versus the automatic system. Are there differences in between different uh, people regarding how strong that automatic system is? And do some types of careers perhaps strengthen d the deliberate system? Because I, I would recognize that more in an engineering context than say the automatic system decision-making is not always a, an easy thing? Mm. Um, well, I tend to try to stick to things that are very generalizable, which means actually the science that I use is, is, is quite basic. I mean, it's, it's really, you know, fairly, um, it's fairly uncontroversial stuff, apart from the priming research. And so as a result, no, everybody has a deliberate system and everybody has an automatic system and they're all doing what we, what, what I was describing earlier on. I think there is definitely, uh, it's definitely the case that uh, certain people have certain talents and also we know that through neuroplasticity, the more that you repeat an activity, the more uh, firmly embedded it becomes. So of course you do end up with differences in aptitudes um, in what the what the deliberate system can do I, I think I think that everybody can become more aware of what their automatic system is up to I mean by definition it's automatic that's how it's lightening the load on the conscious part of your brain but you can understand some of the shortcuts that it's taking and then that does give you some insight into how you behave when you're not at your best, how other people behave when they're not at their best, and how you can, how you can reverse that. So I do think that it's possible to, to get better at recognizing that interplay. 
And it may well be that engineers have an appetite for understanding the behavioral science side of it, which means that they might you know, get with this quite quickly. I have to see. Tell me later. <laughs> And then I'll come up to you. Hi, Caroline uh, Sinead Stringer. I'm um, uh, an executive on the executive uh, behavioural science uh, masters, um, and but my background is in finance. Um, I'm interested in this in terms of the personal angle. Mm. I think as large corporates, and to your experience with McKinsey, will um, perhaps validate this in terms of on the cusp of finding behavioural science exciting and seeing opportunities for them to use. And then, of course, that brings in the ethics in terms of large corporates and how they may or may not be nudging their staff um, in terms of how they expect them to perform and also you know, customers, for example. In terms of looking at that as on a personal level, do you feel that there's a place to deal with the ethics within a corporate environment? Mm. Ethics always comes up when when you're in a room full of people talking about about nudging. You know, to what extent the, the question for for those of you who maybe aren't deeply into this stuff is that, you know, is it really ethical if I know that um, putting a picture of happy people on this information sheet about what the task is is going to make you feel happier? Um, is that me manipulating you? And so you think about that in a, in a company perspective, are they manipulating their staff if they place these nudges in the environment? Are they manipulating their, their customers if they place these nudges in the environment? So it comes down to manipulation. And I think here, I mean, I, I think there's a fairly clear answer. If the outcome is obviously good and obviously benevolent, then there's no issue. If the issue is that the, you know, the outcome is perhaps simply to buy more stuff, which is not you know, as morally black and white, it is a commercial decision, then I think that you can turn to some recent research which says that even when people know that they're being nudged, it still works. <laughs> um, I thought that was quite interesting, that pe people who were told about the effects of anchoring were still then anchored when they went on to, to do the next part of the, the, the task in the experiment. So I am, I would say, a little bit relaxed about this because people have found ways to influence others for millennia. And I think that what this does now, this, this more recent science, is it just gives us a bit of a sense of why certain things work. And I think that that's nothing but, nothing but useful, to be honest. There was a question up here. Yeah. There are a couple, actually. Yeah. yeah. There are a few. Hi, I'm Josh. I'm currently um, working as a user experience designer. Um, so I was interested in kind of the automatic and um, deliberate side of the brains and how do you notice um, that you're actually um, maybe filtering out loads of stuff uh, um, and kind of pick up on the fact that you're doing that? I mean, if there's any techniques... Yeah. Um, in noticing that kind of thing? Yeah, great question. Um, because, after all, it's automatic, so how can you know? <laughs> right? You don't know what you don't know. You think that you're experiencing a completely objective version of reality. And you think that right now. But I guarantee there's stuff that you hear and stuff that you see that other people won't, and vice versa. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what can you do about that? Well, first of all, just be aware that it's happening. And I think that um, my, my solution here is to be preemptive. And to just know that the way that you set up your day and the way you set up the way that you go into a meeting or that you go into a conversation is going to be a bit dependent on what you've decided is important to you. So it really does only take five to ten seconds to say, OK, what mat matters to me? OK, well, what do I want to notice? What do I want to make sure I notice? So there's the preemptive strike, which results from you just knowing that what's top of mind for you is going to shape what you experience. I think the other big way that it's uh, applicable is um, to introduce some humility. So when you're working on a topic and someone has a different view to you, I, I found this, m <laughs> you know, whenever I have an argument, it, it really shortcuts the, the earlier question, it really shortcuts the argument quite quickly because I think, okay, I am sure that I'm right, but I can't be sure I'm right. Okay, so... Maybe I'm wrong. 
And then that leads to a different quality of, of dialogue. So I think it's preemptive strike and humility when you are talking to someone who appears to have a very different view from you, just recognizing that there's a chance that the truth may be somewhere in between. Um, in the back with the scarf on. It Uh, is this speaking? Uh, Dr. Duran Samuel, I'm a psychiatrist and also a student at the um, uh, LSE with Behavioural Sciences. I was wondering, are there people that you find that just can't decide to switch their attention to these things? Because, I mean, you seem constitutionally to be a fairly happy sort of person and maybe it's easier for you to do that. But I come across a lot of people who they just, just can't do that. They're not necessarily depressed, but they just personalities don't allow them to do that yeah I mean you know mindfulness is the classic way of training your attention in a way that's very very focused right and how many of you have tried mindfulness how many of you do it every day and there's a smaller number of hands going up so I think it it definitely takes time to train train yourself to notice where your attention is going and and that's, you know, for anyone, um, the more that you do this sort of stuff, the easier, it, the easier it becomes. Have I ever found anyone who just could not do it? No, I actually haven't. But I, I do think that if I look back over the years of consulting and coaching, there's definitely, if I'm working with a group of people, the aha moment happens at different points if I'm working with them over six months. So you definitely see that different tipping point uh, for people. Can you raise your hands high so I can actually see <laughs> here in the front? Hello, uh, I'm Bailey. I work at a tech startup, so I'm kind of interested in the point about manipulating <laughs> people. <laughs> and you I wondered if you like had to. any. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, I think the truth is, right, any organization would prefer it if all of the members had a good day rather yeah. than a bad day. So um, I suppose any tips? I'm going in tomorrow, 80 people. How can I try and make sure that every member of the team has a good day? Hmm. <laughs> Buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> so did you hear that voice? I don't know where it came from. <laughs> um, I, think <coughs> I think there are lots. So one of the things I noticed when people would ask me what's in the book, you know, when you're talking about having a good day, um, they would say, give me a tip, give me a tip. And whenever I launched in and just gave them the most, <coughs> sorry, whatever tip was top of mind, you know, I'd often get a kind of slightly blank look. And I'm like, yeah, that's useful. But it, it transformed when I asked them, so what are you wrestling with right now? And then they'd tell me whatever they were wrestling with. And then I would be able to give a much more targeted answer. So I'm doing the same with you. So what is your company wrestling with? <laughs> Mm. Mm. Well, I, I mean, one of my favorite things in meetings, especially if you're discussing change, which is always challenging because there's often a sense of nervousness about what that's going to mean for us. And if you remember that we struggle to think about the future because it's abstract and it's not concrete, so that's hard work for people's brains. Um, so anything that you can do to make discussions of this sort of thing feel easier and more enjoyable is helpful. So my, my, one of my favorite things is to make sure that you start every meeting with some of the positive framing. You say, what good things have happened since we last met? You don't have to be too stagey about it. You can simply say, let's review what everyone's done, pick one success, and then talk about what you think has caused that success that we can learn from. Or some version of those words, right? I mean, there are some times that simply just making sure that you go around and hear what everybody has to say about what's going well can be just as good. Or even saying what good things are happening in the team right now. Just starting with that positive frame. And then thinking about, you know, if there's a problem that's on the table, thinking about when have we solved things, something like this before? And then what do we take from that? What does that equip us to do now? The more that you can put that positive, positive frame around difficult topics, it doesn't mean that you avoid discussing the problems at all. 
but it means that you do it in a more positive frame, which means that people are more engaged. And I think that's probably my favorite thing for meetings. It really makes a big difference. Okay, let's take a few more questions. Raise your hand high um, in the back here. Okay, and I'll, I'll come to you next. <coughs> Hi. Um, firstly, thank you. Um, my name is Paul. I'm doing the MSc in Organizational and Social Psychology. And I was just wondering if you could comment on sort of, I guess, the the attitude that traditional traditional corporate managers and leaders have toward this kind of research, especially um, things like mindfulness and mm. self-awareness. Because that's the body of literature is obviously growing, that that's a very positive thing, even yeah. for production and efficiency and those sorts of things. But um, is there resistance to it, or are they generally open, or what does that typically look like? I think it's changing a lot, uh, has changed a lot. Um, the, thing that, the thing that has been easy right from the beginning is that using a little bit of behavioral science, um, I found really super helpful in working with senior people and um, technical people, smart people of all types, really, who are trying to shift either the way they behave or their team or their board or their company or their organization. Because there's so much woolly stuff out there on, you know, how do you shift people's cultural behavior that they're just relieved to find that there's something which is a bit more structured that might actually explain why someone behaves dysfunctionally when they're feeling at all threatened and what those threats might be. So I think on that side, I found nothing but receptiveness. I mean, even kind of, thank goodness, because this actually allows us to get our heads around something which felt a bit woo-woo before. Um, on the mindfulness side and all the kind of the links between un people understanding that there is a connection between um, the mind and the body, that the way we treat our body affects the, the quality of thinking that we can do. Um, yeah, that's transformation. I think that it's been really helped by certain big companies like Google really getting behind it. And then everybody wants to copy what Google does. So I, I think that these, these leading edge uh, adopters have really, really helped. I think the fact that the US Army adopted it uh, really, really fully uh, has made a, a big difference to a different type of person. So the more that we're gathering this, this information, the better. The downside, the, the challenge that people often say is, yeah, but I can't go on an eight week course. And, I know it's a great idea to meditate, but where do I get that 20 minutes? You know, I, I'm so stressed and stretched. So um, I've been, <laughs> I've made it a bit of a, a mission in the last few years to dig out every study that shows that shorter and shorter and shorter amounts of mindfulness make a difference. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I mean, there are some that show that, you know, really, really small amounts, you know, maybe five minutes. I, in the book, I talk about mindfulness moments, that even a moment of gathering your thoughts, focusing on one thing, possibly your breath, feeling your feet on the floor, can give your, give your brain a chance to catch up, let's say. Um, that's uh, not good science, what I just said, but you know what I mean. So I think, uh, I think that... Even there, those who are a bit skeptical about how this could possibly be built into everyday working life, I think that the, the I think that it's going to tumble that last wall. So, hey, hello. Um, my name is Daniele. Uh, I come from Rome. I'm in Erasmus in here in Middlesex University. Were you in that hotel? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so coming Which from side Rome. Of the room were you on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, coming from Rome, there is a really good author, a Latin author, that is Seneca. Uh, I don't know if it's like talking about this thing. That's why I like that so much. I'm reading this book right now, and it's Tranquility of the Soul. So it's about removing frustration and things. My question is, if we can understand what the automatic part is removing uh, by confronting ourselves with others. So it's like, um, having another point of view that is having another in interpretation of the world, talk with him and understand more about what we are removing. So, well, absolutely, and it's, it's a good way of. Um, well, <laughs> you know, if I if I if I'd done more reading before I had that meeting with Lucas, I would have approached that conversation in a very different way. And of course, I later did, right? So whenever I did have, as I mentioned earlier, whenever I did then go on to have a, a conflict or a disagreement. I was much more willing and open to explore where they were coming from, why they thought what they thought, and 
also to look for the common ground between between us. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think that there is a real. So there's often there's often an overlap between what we're learning from today's behavioral science and ancient wisdom about the right way to approach uh, approach life. I mean, there's a wonderful book that some of you may know, The Happiness Hypothesis, which Jonathan Haidt wrote, and his idea was exactly that: was many of these ancient philosophers are basically giving the sa gave the same advice that I'm giving now. It's just that the explanation has changed. And as a result of us understanding more why these things work, perhaps more people will be willing to embrace them. Thank you. OK, so we're going to wrap up with just a few final questions. You're in the front <laughs> row. He's really popular. A lot of people are pointing to him, saying, oh. take his question. Yeah. Take his question. <laughs> It better be a good question now. Okay, <laughs> no pressure. Um, my name is Gervais Folden. I work at the Department of Energy and Climate Change uh, for the government. Um, my question is, uh, do you think there's ever a risk um, nudging yourselves in this way, um, as there can be kind of nudging other people, that uh, you might get a negative outcome? I'm thinking of the example, say, with Lucas. Now, is it a good thing uh, that he had kind of primed himself to be really positive uh, and he'd, you know, wh he, whatever, he'd set those primers, put himself in a certain mood, and yet he's blind to what's happening, you might say, in the room. I mean, you know, great that he's felt positive and he has a good outcome from it. Is that really what you want to achieve in the end? You know, is there a risk that you, you blind yourself and you really should be maybe grounding yourself in the room and paying attention to what everyone else is thinking and feeling rather than focusing yeah. on your own uh, emotions like that? I think my answer is that the technology here is kind of neutral, right? <laughs> Whatever's top of mind for you is going to affect what you see and hear and what you experience. So all I'm saying is that you might as well be a bit more deliberate about that. I mean, if that's going to shape your reality, why not make it a reality that's more enjoyable or more focused or more productive? Um, so you're always going to get a partial, a partial view. So your point is well taken. That that means you're still missing stuff. You're just missing different stuff. <laughs> um, and therefore, then I would say, well, you know, there's, uh, there's some power to thinking about what are the powerful um, intentions to set when you're going into a meeting. It may not be simply to notice good things. Um, whenever I used to run a client workshop, uh, we used to gather the team beforehand and say, okay, what are your intentions for the workshop? And it was just, apart from anything else, it was a chance to slow down, check in, think what is most important. And everybody would say something slightly different. And it would often be for me, it wasn't just, you know, everything's going to be amazing, I'm just going to spot everything that's amazing. It was often exactly what you're saying. It was, I want to really attend to where people are at, and I want to really notice where people are in the room, because the whole reason for doing this workshop is to help them develop as, as, as leaders, as people. Um, and so, yeah, there's some, there's some art in choosing the right intentions that are not going to blind you to things that matter. And that's why it goes back to asking yourself, what really matters here? What matters most in making this an impactful, a successful interaction? So apologies that I can't take all the questions in the room, um, but we do need to keep this to time. Uh, just a reminder, the book is available for purchase outside. It is packed with information. There is basically a piece of advice on just about every page. So it's very hard to summarize in a short talk like this. Um, I would really encourage you to get the book. And that's coming from me. Caroline did not tell me to say that. <laughs> I read the book, and I found it really useful. Thank you. Um, and so Caroline will be here for about 15 minutes to sign the book on stage. And um, we also have some free pens that the stewards are going to hand out to you as you exit, courtesy of the LSE Behavioral Lab. <laughs> so anyway, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you.